All right, welcome back. We are thrilled to have the SEC's Richard Best with us for the next session. Richard is, as of August 2020, the new director of the New York Regional Office. And he now has the uh, unique distinction of having been the head of three SEC offices, Salt Lake, Atlanta, and now New York, his home. In New York, Richard leads a team of approximately 400 staff in a, in a really vital SEC office that's responsible for more than 4,000 investment banks, investment advisors, broker dealers, mutual funds, hedge funds. Um, he previously served as chief counsel and a trial attorney at FINRA and as an assistant district attorney in the Bronx in New York. Richard, we're really looking forward to uh, learning about your new position in New York. Welcome. Thanks, Bruce. And of course, we have George Canellis. George is a partner at Millbank, and he is a great person to lead this discussion. You know, not only is he a former co-director of the Enforcement Division, as well as a longtime federal prosecutor in the Southern District of New York, but on top of all that, George was himself the director of the SEC's New York Regional Office back in 2009 uh, and for, for a few years. So, George, welcome, and I'm really pleased to turn it over to you. Great. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to, to uh, uh, speak with Rich uh, before before this audience. Um, I, Rich, I'm going to begin with uh, what I hope is a nice soft question. You've now been fully two months on the on the job. And uh, as Bruce said, you have had really a unique perspective. Salt Lake is the smallest regional office. New York is the largest. And you've also experienced um, the, the job of regional director of Atlanta. So um, you have uh, an enormous perspective of the field. Um, can I begin with a question? What, what strikes you as you now um, acclimate to your new job as the biggest, biggest differences between the offices, both from an enforcement and if relevant exam perspective? Well, I think that um, one of the things you touched on and Bruce mentioned it uh, is obviously the size, right? In Salt Lake, uh, in terms of the, the number of staff members, we had somewhere around 25 or so uh, staff members uh, covering uh, the state of Utah and the registrant population um, in Utah um, was obviously not as big as Atlanta or New York. Uh, in Atlanta, uh, just in terms of size, uh, we, we had uh, approximately 135 attorneys, accountants, and support team members, including contractors. And we were covering, uh, we're covering the state of Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina, and Alabama. And uh, encompassed in that, in Atlanta, uh, were two significant financial centers, uh, that being Atlanta and Charlotte, and the registrants and public companies there. Uh, in New York, uh, as you mentioned, uh, and as Bruce mentioned, um, it's the largest regional office with over 400 attorneys, accountants, investigators, and support team members uh, uh, covering New York and New Jersey and the largest concentration of uh, financial firms in the country. Uh, so uh, going from the smallest to the largest, uh, uh, just in terms of exams and enforcement, um, each part of the country, as I have experienced, um, has its own uh, unique challenges, and uh, what I found is is that regional directors have to tailor the uh, the strategy um, to the region, to the registrant population, um, and also to the investor, uh, the investors who are in the area. Um, so you mentioned the registrant population, I, and I obviously you have the largest in the country. Um, I think you have last by my count more than four thousand, including really almost all of the biggest uh, broker dealers, um, as well as many of the largest investment advisors. Um, I, uh, when, you think about, um, when you think about your registrant population in the New York region, um, in the current markets, what do you think of as the, the most significant risks for them? How do, you, how do you go about thinking about that? Well, there are a couple of things that, that come to mind. The first is uh, I, the current pandemic and the um, risks associated with uh, with a employee workforce who is dispersed um, across the country. 
uh, when you meld that with uh, with uh, cyber risks, um, uh, there are uh, obviously two um, significant areas that registrants will have to pay attention to, um, uh, just in terms of securing their their facilities, securing their their uh, uh, their customer information and other information, but also uh, making sure that um, they're continuing to comply with securities laws and rules as their um, as their workforce is dispersed around the country. Um, those are just two um, significant risks. And um, and to to deal with your four thousand plus registrants, the mm -hmm. New York office has the largest exam staff in the country. I think um, close to. 25 or 30 percent of all examiners at the SEC um, are in the New York office, um, and uh, the enforcement staff is the largest outside of New outside of Washington. Um, can, can you can you um, tell us a little bit about how you glue your enforcement programs together with your exam programs, with the nature of their interaction? Sure, uh, I think that. The, the way that I, I've thought about it, it doesn't matter um, in which office I've been, is that they um, they have to work effectively together. So there has to be communication between the two sides of the program, recognizing that uh, each side of the program is going to deal with risk um, in the region in a different way. From a uh, from a examination perspective, they're obviously looking at the risks. Uh, of the registrants and which registrants they'll examine in a particular year. Uh, and uh, when it's appropriate for exam to send a referral to enforcement, um, figuring out the right time uh, for enforcement to be notified um, that a referral may be coming or that a referral uh, is has been uh, sent over for exam is important. Um, but also having communication back and forth between uh, exam and enforcement about some of the risks in the region. For example, uh, what I've seen in some areas is that exam uh, will have a very close relationship with the examiners in these states. Um, and therefore, they're getting intelligence in and information in about registrants from the states, from the state exam teams, depending on where they are. Uh, enforcement tends to have a closer relationship with law enforcement um, in the region. So they're getting uh, information about risk from law enforcement. But what's important for the regional office to do is to make sure that those feeds of information, whether it's coming from SROs in enforcement um, or exam or state regulators uh, in, uh, in enforcement or exam, that that information is being put together on both sides of the program so both sides can assess risk. And, and the way we do that and the way we've done it, um, uh, both in uh, Atlanta, New York, um, and, and also in Salt Lake, is to make sure that there's communication. Uh, in Atlanta and, and in New York, uh, we have regular meetings uh, where the senior leaders for exam and enforcement have an opportunity to talk about what's happening in their program. Um, and uh, there are, uh, what we had in Atlanta, what we have in New York in some parts of the program is people who are assigned to look at risks, people who are assigned to uh, look at the incoming tips, complaints, and referrals, and to talk to each side of the program to make sure uh, that uh, the folks who are deciding on the exams or deciding whether to open cases um, have a good perspective um, on the region. Can you, can you give us a practical sense of how exam referrals to enforcement work in the New York office or how you envision them working in the future? Okay, so, so what, I could, what, what may work is for me to give you an, give you an idea of uh, both Atlanta and New York, right? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, in Atlanta, uh, I, it, it really depends. In a traditional case, uh, non-emergency case, um, I, there would be some type of a memo that's created and, and that memo would go over to, um, from exam over to enforcement and they would schedule a meeting to talk about the referral, talk about some of the findings and enforcement would make an independent determination of whether or not 
um, that's a referral that they're going to accept and open an investigation. Um, and the reason I say in a normal case is that can speed up if there is ongoing fraud, if investors are harmed or are, are, are being harmed immediately. Um, so that meeting um, can happen. Uh, and within a very short period of time, enforcement can be brought on to a matter. If the exam believes that something is going to go to enforcement, they may notify them this this looks like an ongoing fraud uh, and enforcement staff members, we can begin to deploy and prepare enforcement staff members to take on take on a case. What has happened in Atlanta from what I see in New York is very, very similar. Um, we have someone in New York who is uh, who from on the enforcement side, an assistant director who uh, reviews our tips, complaints, and referrals, and is someone who our exam teams will reach out to if they have a, a case uh, potential referral coming in. Um, they'll also reach directly out. The associate directors will reach out to, an exam will reach out to the associate directors and enforcement and let them know. We think that there may be a potential referral coming over. Uh, when we get the referral, when enforcement gets it, uh, enforcement will schedule a meeting with exam. And again, They'll sit down and talk about what did they find? What may, what do they think makes this a matter for enforcement? And then enforcement will make a, make a determination. Of course, whether I was in Atlanta or now in New York, I'm involved, integrally involved in the process um, on both sides. And sometimes you'll have a matter transition from exam to enforcement quickly without, without the exam being concluded, right? Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll say differently. They may speed up the exam and say, we're going to send this part of the, uh, of, of the exam to you. For example, if there is an ongoing fraud, they may send that portion of their findings to enforcement um, directly uh, so that enforcement can look at that ongoing fraud. They may be other parts of the, of the, of the registrant that they want to continue to look at, but as to that particular issue, um, that may go straight over to to enforcement. And that, I think, is uh, probably the best way for us to ensure that investors are protected. And would, would one know if a matter, an ongoing exam had been referred to enforcement um, while it's still ongoing? Would one know that if one were on the other side of that exam? I would imagine, yes. How, how would you know? The, the I mean, exam, does, the does, enforcement, does enforcement typically step step in and make their involvement known, or do they shadow the exam um, and monitor it while it's ongoing, or or both? No, no. I, I see what you I see what you're asking. Uh, the enforcement is not is not shadowing um, an exam. Uh, enforcement, if there is a belief that there is a um, ongoing fraud, enforcement will. Um, there'll be a referral over to enforcement. Of course, if it is a um, Ponzi scheme or, or or some type of fraud uh, of that nature, for certain in certain instances, the referral may happen, and uh, exam may not notify the registrant. We're going to make this referral to enforcement because maybe the, the, perhaps the funds will disappear. Uh, uh, so in those instances, perhaps not. But in the regular course uh, of a referral going over. Um, the registrant will be notified that um, that there's a referral being made. And do referrals, Rich, from the New York exam program to the enforcement program always go to the NIRO enforcement program, or do you sometimes refer out and away to other um, components of the enforcement division in the United States? Well, it depends, because remember, we have units. So um, it could be that a referral goes to a unit, um, it, there could be factors that are that are uh, that may cause a particular referral to go to another um, office, but for the most part, a referral in New York is going to go to the New York office. And uh, which specialty units um, currently have representation within the New York regional office? We have uh, we have the cyber uh the, the the cyber unit asset management market abuse and complex financial instruments uh we also though it's important to note have the retail strategy uh and micro micro cap task forces in new york and um and uh what what um what what is the head count of the 
um, staff who are devoted to the specialty units versus those who are devoted to the core program? Uh, I believe we have, and this is an important distinction to make, we have, uh, we, we will talk about full-time employees versus contractors. There are about 185 enforcement staff members in New York, uh, of which a little over 30, I believe, are devoted to units. And when there are um, referrals to be had, either from outside the SEC or from within the exam program, could you tell us a little bit about um, the method by which uh, it's determined whether those matters are referred to one of the core groups or one of the specialty units? So I, I think the best way to do that is to go back and look at the way cases are coming in. Um, in the first instance, if a new matter comes in through a TCR, our Office of Market Intelligence staff will send it to either the core or to a specialized unit. So when a, uh, whether it is a uh, investor or counsel uh, goes to our tips, complaints, and referral page and submits a tip, it, those tips are funneled, doesn't matter where they are in the country, they're funneled to the Office of market intelligence for them to triage them. So we have uh, investigators um, who are closely looking at these tips, looking to see whether they're ties to a particular region, uh, whether they uh, it's appropriate for a particular tip to be routed to, uh, to one of the units. And that would be the first instance where um, a determination is made that a particular matter, tip, complaint, or referral um, may go to a unit versus um, uh, into the core. And I, I think we should mention to those who are listening that they're seeing the units in the core, we tend to refer to uh, the staff members who handle general tips and complaints and referrals as our core versus uh, members of the specialized units. And that's the way we make that distinction. But also, we also have to remember that uh, we have a very, um, uh, 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 very creative staff who sometimes they self-generate cases. So it doesn't matter whether it's in the units or in the core, uh, those members can, uh, may, may read something in the paper, they may uh, conduct some analysis of their own and, and come up with a case. And in that instance, um, uh, it could be that the case goes into the core or into the units. Um, one thing that may happen in some instances, which I've seen in some offices, is for members of the uh, core and the units uh, to work together where someone has a particular specialty or interest or connection to a case. So Rich, um, we can all observe that your enforcement program in New York is still humming during COVID. Um, can you um, give us a little bit of a sense for how investigations are being carried out under COVID and any particular challenges that you're facing? How's it going? Sure. Um, I, I don't think that anyone in, in America would say that it hasn't been a difficult seven months uh, as we transitioned around the country to uh, to remote telework. Um, I, I one of the things I'm particularly proud of is that our chairman uh, and all of the regional offices, uh, in order to keep our staff safe, moved to mandatory telework very early. It was, it was around mid March and. Uh, the other thing that I'm proud of, proud of is that the staff has done an excellent job in moving to this new telework environment, uh, uh, both on the exam and the enforcement side. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, on the exam side, uh, around the country, uh, uh, there was a recognition made in March and April that uh, not only were the SEC staff members dealing with a difficult time, but also uh, the uh, the registrants were. So uh, on the exam side of uh, many of the offices, all of the offices, uh, uh, there was outreach done to, uh, to, to registrants. And that continued for a period of time until uh, I think uh, all of us thought that uh, we could resume our, our exams. And for the most part, we've been conducting remote exams uh, since uh, very likely late April, May. And those have been uh, very effective. Uh, the team members are learning every day and moving forward with them. Similarly, on the enforcement side, uh, 
they, their witness interviews, remote witness interviews are taking place. Uh, 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 investigations are moving forward. Uh, uh, the, the teams are taking uh, testimony remotely. In fact, our Chicago office uh, successfully completed a, uh, a, a virtual trial um, uh, a couple of months ago over the summer. Uh, so both on the enforcement and examination side, I think that uh, we're coping with a very difficult situation and uh, making strides every day. And uh, is, uh, is virtual testimony, investigative testimony, going smoothly in your view? I think it is. Uh, they, there are obviously going to be challenges, uh, different challenges, um, depending on, on the case and what's needed. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the particular witnesses, um, um, uh, figuring out how to deal with documents. As you know, our cases are document intensive. Um, but again, it's the, it's the ability to adapt. Have you, uh, have you, in adapting, Rich, have you made, in New York, have you, do you make some accommodations for virtual testimony? For example, do you provide exhibits in advance to deal with the document issue? I think we, I, I would say we do, we take it on a case by case basis, right? We, we look at what the case is, we look at um, what's needed and uh, the best way to, um, to, uh, to deal with getting the interview done in the most effective way. So in, in some instances, yes, we, we go ahead, we provide the, uh, the documents in advance um, in order for, uh, in order for, uh, uh, folks to have them in the room, but there are ways to do it where uh, the documents are um, are are provided and available um, and viewable when the when the testimony begins. And have you had any resistance to requests by the enforcement program for remote testimony? Uh, you're talking about from the defense bar. Yeah. Uh, sure. Or the individual. Uh, sure. The what we have found is, though, is that for the most part, uh, people have adjusted and, and have tried their tried to um, uh, to provide testimony when we've asked. Of course, there are going to be instances where it's harder for us to do that than others, um, and we have found um, uh, ways uh, for us to try to adjust to any particular uh, concerns that defense or individuals may have. About um, about providing testimony. We only have a few minutes left. I think about two minutes left. But while while navigating the special challenges of COVID um, in conducting investigations, COVID also I know has presented many substantive issues. I think the chairman um, in on in in at um, on October eight in a speech said that there have been more than one hundred and fifty COVID related investigations that have been opened. I imagine that number may be higher now. Can you speak to those issues at all that you're confronting relating to COVID? Sure, I, I think that uh, at the the chairman uh, uh, Stephanie Avakian and at the time Steve Pekin, now Mark Berger, um, I did an excellent job in kind of pivoting to some of the key issues that we were dealing with at the beginning of the crisis, um, and one of them was. Uh, people who were attempting to take advantage of the crisis, right, and who were putting out press releases and other public communications to impact the price of the stock and uh, when they didn't actually have uh, whatever product it was. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about people who were saying that they had a new cure or they had some, some mechanism that would help people deal with the crisis and it was pushing out the price of the stock in order to manipulate it. And, uh, and one of the things that we were able to do was to put together a steering committee to deal with some of these issues and institute effectively institute trading suspensions. And in some instances, uh, we were able to bring individual cases against uh, some of the persons responsible. Well, I think I think that brings us to the end of our time period. Rich, um, really, really good luck with new, being the steward of the New York office. I personally wish you well. Don't screw it up. We all we all know you won't. <laughs> Thanks so much, George. Uh, Richard, George, thanks so much for that discussion. That was really, really interesting and helpful. Um, our next panel on financial disclosure and accounting fraud will begin in five minutes uh, at 10.40 a.m. 
We'll see you here in five minutes. Thank you.